Ozark has been an amazing show from start to finish, but there is more lying in those murky waters than first meets the eye. Ever since Breaking Bad ended, we were left with a deep void in our life. Thankfully though, Netflix gave us another dark, gritty, family-based crime drama in the form of Ozark. Just as addictive and also full of twisted family values, Ozark has been a roller coaster ride ever since the first episode with a glossy style and a stellar cast. Also like Breaking Bad, Ozark is created with a high level of attention to detail, meaning there are tons of subtle references, easter eggs, hidden meanings, and fun behind the scenes stories for us to dig into. And we've got our shovels out here as we're going to go into those hidden depths and give you 25 things that you might have missed and put the O in Ozark. And beware, there will be some heavy Ozark spoilers in this video. Alright, let's get started. The Langmores are said to be the ones who are cursed, but Season 3 only further proved that it is actually the Bird family that are cursed, bringing down everyone around them. This is actually secretly suggested in their family name. On the surface, the name Bird doesn't seem to mean much, but showrunner Chris Mundy explained there's a hidden meaning to it. He said that their name represents the family taking flight from Chicago after the going got rough, migrating south and becoming an invasive species, taking over their new habitat and wreaking havoc. This is ironic seeing as the youngest member of the family, Jonah, becomes obsessed with ousting the European starling that is seen as an invasive species that disrupts the local ecosystem, just like the birds. Can I kill starlings? What? Also, the birds bring a great level of death and destruction with them, and one of the birds most associated with death is the scavenger bird, the vulture, which is used in their promotional material. But the analogy of the family goes a little bit further than that. Addiction is a constant theme throughout the show, with a number of characters addicted to alcohol, drugs, power, and of course, money. And the birds are the human embodiment of addiction and greed. Not only are they power hungry and obsessed with accumulating wealth and status, but others who've become associated with them, such as Ruth Langmore, usually end up in a worse place than they started. The Langmores see them as a sickness, and Wyatt describes the family in almost the exact same way you would describe an addiction, and many people who come in contact with the birds often find themselves dead or in jail. Fitting, seeing as they are in the drug gambit. An example of an addictive trait is repetition, and going through things in a circular motion. One of the things you might have noticed is that despite the dilemmas and problems they find themselves in, the birds are always finding themselves in the same situation and falling back to the same place they originally found themselves in. This circular motion and repetition in the plot is shown from the very beginning, with the O in Ozark being highlighted to indicate the circular trajectory the family find themselves in. You might be thinking we're looking a little too much into that, but when you pair it with the next point, it makes more sense. That's because in every episode, the title cards are always different and unique. Other than the O that is the main focal point of the title card, we see four different pictures that form the shape of the letters Z, A, R, K, which of course spell out, oh yeah, Ozark. But in each episode, these four letters depict different imagery and foreshadow the events to come in that episode. Take episode one, which shows Marty on his knees, as well as Wendy's lover falling to his death, as well as the Chicago skyline and the gun, all of which have an impact on the plot in the pilot. If you end up re-watching the show, and we strongly suggest you do, make sure to check out the different imagery in each of the title cards, and of course the circular O that wraps them all together. Ozark has had a number of emotional and shocking deaths, but one of the standout ones has to be the death of the fallen pastor, Mason Young. Mason had a rough time of it, to put it mildly, with his nightmare beginning when his pregnant wife was killed by the Snells, who were using his sermons to secretly deal drugs, but kept his child, Zeke, alive. Mason struggles to care for his son and deal with the loss of his wife, and Zeke is eventually taken from his care, eventually ending up with the woman who caused his misery. Mason snaps and takes his anger out on the birds, kidnapping Wendy and eventually threatening to kill her with a screwdriver. To save Wendy, Marty shoots Mason and leaves him bleeding on the floor. But if you look closely, there is a small Easter egg, with Mason's blood forming the shape of wings, symbolizing he is a fallen angel. Now, seeing Jason Bateman directs and stars in Ozark, and the fact that the show is on Netflix, makes it unsurprising that there is an easter egg to the hit comedy Arrested Development, which also starred Jason Bateman as Michael Bluth. 
in the show, Michael takes over family affairs after his father, George Blue Sr., is sent to prison. As we find out, his dealings weren't always exactly legal. In fact, he even hides a vast amount of cash in the walls of the frozen banana stand. Know who else stashes cash in the wall? Marty Bird, who hoards cash inside the walls of the resort they launder money through. But it's not just the banana stand that acts as the only easter egg for Arrested Development, although this easter egg is much more directly linked to Bateman himself. In Arrested Development, Michael has a slight obsession with maritime law, I mean who doesn't, and is very well versed when it comes to legal matters at sea. It seems Bateman's character Marty also has a love of maritime law, as he pays reference to it when he lays out his master plan. Maybe we should start calling him Jason Boatman. <laughs> Uh, at least I make myself laugh. But Arrested Development is not the only project on Jason Bateman's CV to get an easter egg in Ozark. With there being a callback to the comedy movie he starred in alongside Jason Sudeikis and Charlie Day, Horrible Bosses. The scene that is referenced in Ozark is when in Horrible Bosses, Dale and Nick break into Bobby's home, and Dale rolls down his sleeves and places them over his hands and picks up a drug-filled ashtray, before of course dropping it and sending the contents flying. Jason Bateman's Marty does a similar thing when he too rolls down his sleeves to cover his hands and not leave fingerprints while searching through his therapist, Sue's house. Who knew sleeves could be so versatile? One of the things you might have noticed in the background is that the characters in Ozark like to watch a lot of football. But if you are paying close attention, the action on screen isn't NFL, nor is it college football. It's never addressed, but the football they are actually watching is the Canadian Football League, also known as the CFL, with a number of Toronto Argonauts and Montreal Alouettes games being shown on screen. Why it's CFL is unclear. It might be something to do on the production side. But we like to think the birds are just diehard CFL fans. Maybe they prefer the three down system? Or maybe it's because The Rock used to play in it? Who knows? Alright, this next one goes out to all you music fans out there. In the episode titled Kaleidoscope, Marty starts discussing the day he believes music died and mentions American singer-songwriter Richie Valens. The connection with Valens and Ozark goes deeper than that though, with Isai Morales, who plays Dell on the show, playing the brother of Richie, Bob Valens, in the 1987 movie La Bamba. Now, you probably haven't spent much time looking at Jason Bateman's feet or the shoes he wears, because let's face it, that would be kind of weird. But if you do end up taking more time looking at the actor's feet over the course of his works, you might notice a similarity, that he always wears his favorite shoe brand, New Balance. Jason Bateman seems to have a deep affiliation with the brand, so it's no surprise that Ozark is no different with him of course rocking the New Balance. Because like Kawhi Leonard, Bateman gets paid. Like Breaking Bad, Ozark has a lot of attention to detail when it comes to the criminal actions the characters partake in. And like Walter White in his Crystal Blue, you might be wondering just how accurate these criminal acts are. Well, in Ozark's case, the money laundering you see in the show is actually very, very accurate. That's down to the fact that one of the agencies that seek to stop money laundering, the FBI, actually helped them do it. The writers needed to learn and develop an understanding on how to launder money to make the show more realistic and help with the story and character building. So they did what any person would do and called the FBI to ask how exactly they could do it. Chris Mundy stated, We had an FBI agent who investigates money laundering come and sit down with us for a day so we could pick her brain. So yeah, safe to say, it's pretty accurate. One of the things that makes this show so great is the cast particularly its star duo Jason Bateman and Laura Linney. Bateman and Linney undoubtedly do a great job and are almost perfect for the parts. But originally, neither of them were interested in the project. Laura Linney reportedly had no interest in doing a series, but reportedly became interested upon learning Jason Bateman's possible involvement and wanted to see him expand his acting range, moving from comedy to drama. But Bateman too reportedly wasn't initially interested, as he did not want to get involved in another series after Arrested Development and instead wanted to focus on features. But as you know and is pretty clear, they were both eventually convinced to join the show. One of the ways Bateman was convinced to join the cast of Ozark is because he was given the opportunity to direct. Initially, a reason why Bateman wasn't as interested to join the show was because he wanted to direct a feature movie, and the scheduling conflicts would have prevented him from doing so. So, the show offered him to direct all the episodes in season 1, 
but a scheduling conflict prevented him from doing so, so he instead directed four of the episodes and became one of the producers of the show. So all in all, it worked out pretty well for him. The strength of the pilot episode as well was another reason he became so interested in the project. But just because the writing was already great didn't mean it couldn't have been expanded further. Linny was also intrigued by the writing and the strength of the script, but became concerned that the character of Wendy was somewhat one-dimensional and just a wife. So, Linny voiced her concerns to Bateman, who agreed with her, and the two fleshed out the character together, making her as dark and duplicitous as any other character on the show. Although even Linny has no idea which way Wendy's moral compass is spinning. It's not just the strength of the primary duo that makes the show so engaging though with there being some great performances from a number of side characters. One such performance is the one provided by Peter Mullen, who played one of the local drug kingpins, Jacob Snell. And although his character was short-lived, his performance was probably one of the most memorable. Mullen is a well-known character actor and came to Bateman's attention after seeing him in Top of the Lake and was so intrigued by the actor that he aggressively pursued him, desperate to bring him in the show. They did this before there was even a script to show the actor, but Mullen was seemingly convinced by the pitch given to him. Another one of the great actors in the show is Sophia Hublitz, who plays Marty and Wendy's daughter Charlotte, but the role nearly went to Dance Mom star Chloe Lukasiak, who auditioned for the role, and you can even see her audition tape online. Check it out. Sometimes there's things we really don't want to have to do in our jobs, and that was certainly the case for Ruth Langmore actor Julia Garner. Although you can see where she's coming from in her case, as in one scene she was required to hold a mouse. Now, while the mouse was presumably sanitary, Gardner apparently has a phobia of rodents, and so in a scene where she's supposed to pick up a mouse and drop it into some water, she kept having severe panic attacks and was unable to complete the scene, so instead a hand double had to be used. And if you look carefully, you may notice that it isn't Garner's hand that drops the mouse, but instead probably one of the production team. The crew apparently got a good laugh out of it though, although Garner was left somewhat embarrassed over her rodent-based fears. Man, Ratatouille must be like a horror movie for her. One of the best characters to be introduced in Season 3 was Wendy's brother Ben, played by Tom Pelfrey, and his early death was ultimately one of the saddest. While there are some theories that suggest the character isn't actually dead down to the fact that his death took place off screen, the showrunners have seemingly put an end to those rumors, saying the character is done and dusted. But let's of course not forget Jon Snow. But what made the character so compelling is the performance given by Pelfrey, who played the character of delicacy and tact, making sure that the struggles of bipolar disorder and mental illness were handled in a respectful way. One of the ways he did this was by fully researching mental illness and studying it so he could fully dive into the character and portray the full amount of complexities people with mental illness have. Like money laundering, the show also pays a great amount of attention to detail to the world of fly fishing. While it might not seemingly sound as complex as money laundering, the writing team did a great deal of research into the world of fly fishing. The producers brought in two expert fly fishermen to teach the cast to train the actors and to search through the scripts to make sure the script was accurate to the local fishing language and that it was natural. In fact, they did so much research that Mundy said you'd have thought they were doing a documentary on the subject. Bateman and Linny may have shaped their characters and their progression, but one actor who was seemingly along for the ride was Mark Menchaca, who played Russ, with the actor saying he had no idea where the character was going and initially learned from the other cast where his character's arc was headed. Menchaca eventually asked Mundy where his character was going and said he was pleasantly surprised and was thrilled by the character's development. There's no doubt that the setting of the Ozarks makes the perfect backdrop for the show, but you might be wondering why that particular location was picked. Well, the reason comes down to the memories from the show's creator, Bill DeBuque, who is from Missouri and used to spend his summers working at the Lake of the Ozarks and became attached to the place he labeled as the Redneck Riviera. He said he was also inspired by the people he met there, meaning a number of the characters are based on real people. That's a concerning thought. 
But although it is set in Missouri, it doesn't mean it's actually predominantly filmed there. And like a number of MCU movies, the show is actually filmed in Atlanta, Georgia. Atlanta has become a production hub in the US, with a number of shows and movies being filmed there. And Ozark 2 has made use of the area, with a majority of the water scenes being shot on Lake Altoona, which is roughly an hour away from Atlanta, and a number of interior scenes being shot at Chateau Elan. If you wanted to take a trip down to the Ozarks though and delve deep into the show, you can now do that. That's because the show's popularity has led to the creation of the real life Marty Bird's Bar and Grill in Missouri. So if you're hungry and are in Missouri, you can head down to Marty's and chow down on Ruth's Smoked Wings, Wendy's Philly Steak Sandwich, or Dell's Nachos. While we might all love Ozark here, sadly we can't have too much of a good thing as it was announced that season 4, which will be the next season, will sadly be the show's last. Although we will have to wait a little longer for the final season due to, you guessed it, COVID-19, however despite the restrictions the pandemic has caused, production did start this year with filming beginning on November 9th in 2020. Although strict safety protocols may mean the show takes a little longer to complete, and there will likely be greater distance between the crew and cast, as well as less props used on set. What did you make of this video? Any that we missed? Are you a fan of the show? Let us know in the comments below and make sure to subscribe today for all this and more. Thanks for watching Screen Rant. See you next time.